participating in the publication. So I would like to thank you, to thank to Fabio and also the team at uh, Vaidaura Labs that has been helping uh, putting together all the content in order to make the publication. So as you may know, uh, in the year 2005, uh, we decided to launch a competition. In fact, was an idea from Lucas Capelli. Lucas was a former IAC student and is member of the board of trustees now of IAC. Uh, and he proposed uh, to launch a competition in order to debate the future of uh, architecture with people all over the world. And I asked him, uh, but Lucas, uh, other institutions like AA or I don't know, Harvard or others, they do digital competitions. And he said, no, no one is doing digital competitions because uh, in fact, uh, well, I am not sure, but at that time, for example, Instagram didn't exist. Facebook, Facebook was maybe one or two years old. So it was really, um, the digital world was growing and was emerging. And, and then the, the idea of launching a competition through internet architectural competition mostly for young people in fact didn't exist um, that's why we we decide okay let's make an experiment we choose the subject and the subject for the first years was uh, the self-sufficient buildings it was a moment when the economy was booming the price of housing was growing and we thought that if we need to pay more for our apartments our buildings we should buildings should perform more. We should make buildings more ecological, more intelligent, and so on. So that's why we launched that competition. The first year, there were, uh, there were, um, and we got 500 applications. Uh, so it was a, a huge, uh, a huge, uh, let's say, success. And since then, every two years, we have been launching uh, competitions. Uh, and in fact, ACTAR, uh, from the very beginning, were publishing uh, these results. First year, with this uh, small book, a square book, we were selected as finalists for the best book of the year by the Royal Institute of British Architects, by the RIVA. And since then, as I say, we have been doing these competitions. Uh, the award was always to come to make a master program at IAC and at the same time, uh, a small amount of money. So following that tradition, uh, this last year, we decided to launch this competition uh, and we choose the, the topic design for living because it was the moment when we have, we were at the beginning of the pandemia, the coronavirus pandemia. Uh, we were in the lockdown. So all of us, we were distributed, but then we thought that it would be a great challenge for many people around the world to, to think about the future of living but we, we say that living should be not only housing or the city, it should be whatever is related with the idea of living. Uh, so we select, uh, uh, we receive, uh, I think, around 270 projects. Uh, and then it was a process of selection from all of them, we select around 135 projects. Uh, and then these are the projects that publish in the book. From these 135, there was another selection where there were around 35 finalists. And then from these finalists, uh, we offer the jurors. In fact, the, juror, the jury that we have always, the jury was and this time also we, we had people from all over the world uh, with a very international and very expertise, uh, uh, very exp um, expertise um, uh, juror, including uh, world renewed architects. And then at the end, every architect was voting. And then we were very transparent about the numbers of the voting. We upload this in the website. And the result is that we, we had uh, three winners. 
and we have uh, by order and we are very happy that today we have here uh, three of the winners. There were also two finalists that somehow we helped them also to come this year to study at, at IAC. And today we will have these five intervention uh, will be Paulina from Mexico. She was one of the finalists. Uh, We'll have also Nico from China, although she was in uh, Boston at that time, and we'll have uh, the three finalists that will be talking. We have also invited uh, Matilde Marengo, that is the head of studies at IAC, uh, also uh, Fabio Capra, that is the um, coordinator of the Mostar program in Baidaura, and he has been coordinating the production of the book. And also we'll have Daniel Ibanez, that he's the co-director of the master program in Baidaura. He got his yep. PhD from Harvard recently, and he was one of the first winners of that competition. So you know there is a tradition that winners, uh, then they come to Barcelona, sometimes they become teachers, and sometimes they become directors of master programs. So we'll see what happened with our three winners uh, this year um, and also we have Ricardo de Besa representing ACTAR and as you have seen we have a publication this year the publication I think is the thickest one in the history um, yeah so let's begin I will be connected but I will not be talking again because as I say I am in the middle of nowhere and then Fabio will be coordinating this event. Okay, so thank you to all of you. And uh, I want also to say thank you to Laya Pifarre. Laya is the general manager and coordinator and by Daura. Laya, are you there? Uh, yeah. Hello. Yes. Uh, so Laya has been also coordinating all the competition, the website, the euros and everything. And uh, um, yeah, today, we will see the result. We are very happy that you are connected and we are going to start. So please, Fabio, go ahead. Sure, thank you, Vicente. Uh, to start with, I would like to invite uh, Paulina Sevilla, Mariana Martins, and Brice, or Brice, Frances, Franquesa, sorry, to present their work titled A Formula for the Collective. So you can share your screen and start your presentation. You have five, five minutes. Yes, I, work. I am not able to share yet, Fabio. Can you allow me? Yeah, sure. Give us a second. Thank you. Pauline. Hello. So this is our team. The name is a formula for the collective. Um, can you see the next image? Yes. Good. Yes, perfectly. Um, so hello everyone, I'm Mariana, and I'll be starting the presentation. So um, as you see in these images, uh, most of our proposal came from various discussions about the pandemic and about how our exterior spa spaces were connection spaces, our balconies, our windows, our common areas in the building. So uh, it became very evident and important, the quality of our house, our home, and, and understanding how, how precarious situation would be someone that, that didn't have a good house or a decent house, housing. So we, we started by analyzing how we needed to adapt and how it was urgent to adapt to uh, our ways of living to this new context. And our house was, uh, was now our workspace, our production space, our gym, our social space, everything. So this gave new meaning to all the spaces and made us uh, think about, start thinking about how we wanted to make a proposal that could both address the individual scale of our room, our cell, our house, and also the, the community we were in, the buildings we were confined in that ended up being our uh, forced community during this pandemia. That's why uh, Tlatelolco in Mexico City was such a, a good example and object of study for the proposal. 
So we decided to do this in Tlatelolco, which is an important communal housing that was built where, where this is Mexico City and in red we can see where it is. It's in the north of the city, but very close to the city center. Here we can see a zoom of it and it's a big, big complex of housing with almost uh, 100 buildings and 1000 of apartments. We have gardens inside and it was created by, by Mario Pani. We also took this site because it's a, a place with many historical layers. As you can see, we can see the archeological site from the Aztecs. Uh, in the first layer, we can see a church from 1527, uh, made uh, built by the Spanish. And then we can see the, um, the complex of housing. So that's why we decide, like if we, we were thinking how we will live tomorrow, it was important for us to see, to, to take an important place for us that we like in the city and that we, we want to think of a future for the city. Thinking that the, the cities will not build from scratch, that we have to do something with what we have. So this is Tlatelolco in the 60s. And we wanted to introduce you like to understand how is this housing complex in Mexico City. And then we, we ask ourselves how we would like to live in the coming decades. And we took in consideration the global goals from the United Nations for 2050. Um, and taking, in, taking these goals like no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, we made a series of collages where we put what we wanted to see in this place, in this Tlatelolco, future of Tlatelolco. So we had the culture and the leisure, um, bringing to people the access to education, workshops for, for all the ages. We wanted to, we, well, we imagined parks in the rooftops and spaces for kids for community, um, a way to make this more sustainable was to think in food, product, food production with a way of life more healthy, introducing farms and sustainability and places for sports and for health. Yes, and other, another very interesting thing of Tlatelolco is that it was a vanguard building and complex because it mixed all social classes. Uh, it had apartments both for the higher classes and they were mixed with uh, the lower classes. So it meant creating community as, as a small city, as the city should be. So... Uh, Mariana and Paulina, you have one more minute. Okay. okay. Yeah. We thought of uh, making an operation on what if we took all the dining rooms, all the living rooms and all the laundry and the kitchens and put them together and in a concentrated space. That, that way we would increase collective space and diminish private space in order to create this community. And you can see it in more detail in the plans. We created more individual cells for people. We, we completely uh, broke the apartment into cells and then we created bigger communities that could be connected in between the buildings. And as seen before, we offer a kind of reorganization of Tlatelolco, both in architectural and urban space. Uh, we were also very proud to uh, actually work on this urban space because as you can see, it's a large scale uh, built environment, but there is a lot of space. The only thing that is missing is uh, it, there, it, there is a real scale issue in the, in the complex. So you're only going out from your individual space to a totally public space. So we're creating, trying to create like new layers in uh, investing the space as the rooftops and also the connecting to the facades and to the ground, trying to create these new layers to uh, maintain the community that was not existing anymore. So by this, we try to take out all the productive and social and domestic labor spaces and try to command them on some new, uh, new layer as uh, the historical layer before. 
So uh, the, the idea behind all of that is this quote that we put there is this, the individual well-being isn't opposed to the collective one. In fact, the individual prosperity depends on the collective su successfulness, sorry. So we're trying to manage and create that dynamism inside this collectivity, this community, to ensure everyone's a better life, healthier life through sports, health, uh, producing space, social space, and their space. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting, fascinating presentation. Um, thank you. Now I would like to invite Jiang Guan Tian, alias Nico, uh, to present her work titled The Living Rick Island. We hear you very, very low, Nico. No, it's still low. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Can you hear me? No. Mm. How about now? Well, yeah, kind of. Okay, I can speak louder, maybe. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh... Now we hear you well, Nico. So if you speak okay. close to the mic, we, we cool. hear you very well. Cool. Okay. Um, so my name is Nico, and my project is the Living Rig Island. Uh, so it is a reimagined offshore island which involves from discarded um, aging mega infrastructure that found in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico to an island network that supports a new water economy. Um, rethinking and transforming the experience and relationship between human and the ocean, this project treats the symbiotic collaboration of ocean farm and green machines as new forms of ocean industry that are ready to emerge. Um, next page. I don't know what happened. Uh, um, page, page two. Uh, so it's supposed to be double page. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So the North Sea and the Gulf of Mexico have the world's most enormous amount of oil rigs. There are 1,862 oil drilling platforms in the Gulf of Mexico in 2019. So, um, well, by 2025, nearly 60% of checkup oil rigs will fall out of commission due to a prescribed lifespan of 30 years. Alongside this condition of obsolescence, uh, immediate removal of uh, 400 billion subsidies and the accelerated increase of government regulations to the oil industry, these large scale industrial facilities invite responsive design to their second life. While on the other hand, the eutrophication of the seawater in the Gulf of Mexico called dead zone, and has become a very serious ecological disturbance. Um, there were more than 15,000 species in the Gulf. However, for the water and domestic sewage from inland agriculture flow directly from um, north to south of Lake Michigan into the Gulf of Mexico with only slight treatment. These actions have led, in, led, to, in response, uh, led to response to significant changes in the watershed, ecosystem, and biological life form. The disintegration of trophic structures caused by the eutrophication and the changes in biological habitats are destroying the entire ecosystem in the Gulf of Mexico. So my design proposition is to put forward, articulate and visualize an alternative reuse by maximizing the potential of these existing and ex expensive to remove mega infrastructures in 2030 with subsidies removed instead of the enormous labor energy and cost of dismantling these massive industrial infrastructures, they will, they will be repurposed and redesigned as vital bridges between land and ocean. 
My project looks into progressive strategies to reconvert three soon-to-be decommissioned oil infrastructures. It aims to convert them from points of oil extraction, which is the primary source of greenhouse gas emission, to green infrastructures that could harvest the ocean with living organisms that has carbon sequestration potentials, such as um, kelp farming and oyster. And it's envisioned that every abandoned oil rig becomes an artificial reef for the marine ecosystem while offering a new social spatial arrangement for the communities. The size of the practice should offer enough resources to allow a total of 600 people to work and live here completely self-sustained and 20 hybridized water landscape programs will participate and form as a giant filtering sponge to enhance the water quality from the external boundary to the central living rigs. The design will be adaptive to this problem problem zone and responsive to the internal design effort, redesigning the hybridization of the oil rigs and the ocean farm to form a small marine community that could play as a key role of the circular reciprocal metabolism of the water economy. For example, the operation of the marine culture and the hydroponic aquaculture will provide diverse work op opportunities for farmers, technicians, biologists, and researchers. Temporary housing for a particular catastrophic situation like COVID-19 or tourism, including the recreational water events, could stimulate the flow of population and also the investment from inland. The design strategies is incorporating both architectural and landscape interventions. These include, include creating a new housing complex as an offshore village and extending the recalls framing structure to connect the large scale ocean farm within the surrounding water landscape. And all these design goals will form, in, uh, form into four types of programs that symb symbiotically work together um, so finally, we're moving to an economy of decarbonization. It is a matter of time that these oil rigs will soon fall off commission and no longer get that amount of support like before. So as a designer, I would like to consider and reimagine the potential of the second life of this existing material and space we've created and giving the effort to make it revitalize again. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. Thank you. Incredible images and incredible proposals, very alienated with the current situation. Now I would like to, to invite the winner of the third prize uh, with the project called a title Wally. The members are, are Aramis Coruño, Paula Carmela Casia, Angelo Landicho, Altea Poblet, and Jelaine Marin Burgos. Good day. Good day, I'm Altea and this is Aramis, and it is our pleasure to present our entry on behalf of our team, WALL-E, transforming waste into a floating city to restore the sunken kingdom of Pinwang. If you were to ask me, how do you picture our future habitats to look like? I'd probably say flying cars, human pods, artificial intelligence, and so on. How we see the future is greatly influenced by the media we consume. This in turn influences our design, the sign that would later shape our way of living. This is only possible if we have enough resources, but as we continue to mishandle our resources, living in the wasteland is a more likely scenario. By 2050, we would be generating 3.4 billion tons of solid waste. That's roughly 450,000 Eiffel Towers or the whole of Mount Everest. In the Philippines, 20% of the waste end up in the ocean, ranking us third as the biggest ocean polluter of plastic, while the remaining waste end up in poorly managed landfills, which threaten to wipe out coastal villages. This is exactly what happened to the kingdom of Pinwangan, a coastal community so rich in history, but its ancient walls and ruins are now underwater. The whole idea of Wall E revolves around finding life in the middle of the wasteland, the word play takes it a step further as the community is also built on a series of walls that connect and provide foundation for its settlements. Now to address this problem, we came up with floating pods made of recycled plastic waste that can be stacked on top of one another to house the growing population of Pinuangan. So how is a single pod formed? First, 
waste from the surrounding areas is brought to the recycling plant, where waste is transformed into pellets and then transferred to the 3D printing factory. In the factory, these pellets are melted and turned into printing filament that goes into large 3D printers and they come out as panels. Now, a single panel consists of four layers, the outer plastic, surfaces are made of HDPE, which allows it to float. HDPE is extracted from discarded shopping bags and food containers, which make up about 80% of plastic waste. Now, the mesh is made of ABS plastic, which is known to be tough and resistant to impact and water. Plastic fillings work as thermal insulators to maintain a comfy environment. The exposed structural tubing supports the members and also acts as an aesthetic element inside. And then all these parts are then stored and later transported for assembly. Now, the assembled pod takes the form of a Schwarz P surface. And this is a complex form with a reduced surface area, thereby reducing the materials needed for construction, allowing the form to be lightweight while maintaining enough density for greater shock absorption and impact resistance. Let's take a look inside the pod. The pod is divided into four levels. The basement, where the water tank is located. The ground floor, which contains the more public and social spaces for guests to receive. The second floor, a semi-private space with a work-from-home setup and the option to socialize with neighbors through the pod's connecting arms. And lastly, the third floor, which is mainly a private area for sleeping and refuge. Going into detail, two of the micro features of the pod are the evaporative off-grid toilet, where waste is collected and evaporated, saving water and electricity, and space-saving furniture. A pod's total floor area is 60 square meters and can accommodate a typical household size of five. At the center of the complex is a linear park, providing residents access to green spaces. The narrow strip of land is where the fishermen pods, visitor center, and dock are located. The existing fish pens were preserved to further support the livelihood of the community. Fish harvested are then sold at the central market. Before, kids had to ride a boat every day to study, so we provided a dedicated school within the community. Structures necessary to support the development, such as the waste recycling plant, 3D printing factory, and solar desalination plant were also provided. Wally reimagines how we can save sinking communities by creating livable structures from discarded plastic. Instead of looking elsewhere for answers, we used the very waste problem as the solution. The future of living may not end up like the ones we see in movies. It's not simply the technological advancement of mankind, but rather the constant search for solutions to ensure a sustainable and livable future, making architecture, design, and life all the more meaningful. Thank you for listening. Thank you, guys. Very impressive and also, I would say, futuristic or not, not so futuristic uh, proposal in the sense that it's something also, it seems that we need it right now, more or less. Uh, now I would like to invite the second prize winner, uh, Yvonne Asingwe, with the project title Redefining Refugee. I'm going to keep my camera off because I'm using 3G, so I don't have sure. enough data. Don't worry. Okay. Uh, Can... uh, I'm sharing my screen. Sure. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Good. Can you see my screen? Yes, we see the okay, full okay. screen now. Uh, my name is Yvonne Simwe and my project is redefining uh, refugee. <laughs> okay, so I will start uh, from the beginning. Uh, so this, uh, it's a refugee camp that was initially uh, uh, set up by the Red Cross uh, for uh, hundreds of uh, Palestinians, but it became overwhelmed by 
by the Syrians moving in because of the instabilities that are horizontally and then it uh, moved uh, vertically. And people started adding their own structures uh, to the existing buildings, which were unstable. And it became very overcrowded, uh, very unlivable. It has very unsafe uh, connections and it's very unhygienic. So um, this is just a diagram. We are losing you. It started and how it began uh, changing over time when I decided to work with, I decided to work with Thrive in a park. Uh, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, keep going, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so I asked myself, how can people who already struggle economically thrive in a post-COVID society? So I looked at ways that they can find, uh, they can earn money independently from a government because the refugees there, they're usually on welfare. And I looked at ways it can harvest energy in a sustainable manner without depending on the electricity supply from uh, the Lebanese government. And access to clean water also was a problem. And also a win-win situation was vital because you can't just bring in new people inside a refugee camp and expect people to accept them. So, uh, I Ivan, I don't think we're going to be able to follow your presentation because I analyzing the weather in Lebanon, uh, which is relatively they have very high uh, radiation. Um, also, the hottest months are around in July, October. Drill structures and um, stitch the main street with the bridges, basically bridges that provided uh... Ivan, uh, I'm sorry, but we, we, won't, we won't be able to follow the full presentation because your connection is not allow, allowing us to, to hear you well. So I'm really sorry, we, we have to move on. Um, in any case, well, you know, you guys, you will be able to check all the information on the book and also about the project of, of Yvonne that was very, very interesting. Um, now I would like to invite Suwapat Rod Prasar and Pogol Put Wait the Wool, if I try to pronounce it well, with the project Three Life Cycle that were the winners of the first prize of the competition. Hola, guys. We are architect from Thailand. Uh, I'm Bon and this is Sue. Hi. So first, uh, we would like to thank you that lets us become a part of this event. Uh, we, see, we saw a lot of great works and ideas over here, and we really appreciate it. So in order not to waste any time, let us explain how our design proposal started. So back to last year, when I had launched it Advanced Architecture Contest, we have discussed about this topic, design for living. And we are brainstorming how to decide our habitat and environment to fit the way we live in the upcoming years. That's why we start from finding the topics that related to human life challenge. And when we look back to this, the past few years, especially in 2020, we found that people are collectively confronting to these two main issues, which is environmental crisis and pandemic crisis. However, no matter how people create a lot of innovative solutions to tackle with these two problems, we still know the same fact that death is always the unavoidable state that no artifacts could prevent. So from our research, when you look at the data, you will know that climate change, pandemic crisis, 
and a lot of our factors have end up a lot of human life. And from statistics, you will know that there are always an increasing a number of deaths in each year. Unfortunately, the things that we always look over is the final deposition. So you can look at the graph below that their methods and their funerary practice in the current time has a negative effect to the earth, whether it is energy consumption or carbon emission. So if we still deal with the human body after death with the um, conventional methods, it's not only make a negative effect to the one who lives, but it can make a dead rate to become unstoppable in the upcoming years. At this point, we start to reimagine the world, an ideal world where death becomes an essential part of our life cycle. By setting a new paradigm of living through a system that we simply call the life cycle. With this proposal, unlike living in conventional ways, we strongly believe that in the future, home will be the central place for life, which means our home will be the place for us to be born as well as the place for us to pass away. This might leave the meaning of home a little bit scary, but let's see how things work. During the initial state of design process, we are looking for something that would be able to support human beings for their entire life and something that does not consider death as the end of human life cycle. After discussing, we chose to design a multifunctional machine that helps to promote a new living system in which beneficial to all living, death, and the earth. And as a result, we came up with a design of an adaptive pillar structure. In order to uh, achieve the objective, based on a closed-loop self-sustainable system, a pillar needs to create a mutualism relationship between both existing and pass away organisms, as shown in this diagram. So how does the pillar system work? First, by looking at the diagram over here, the design itself takes an advantage of fundamental metabolism process to convert the dead body into a temporal renewable energy for housing and also provide a nourishment for plants to grow in the future. Secondly, with the flexible design, the pillar is expected to be constructed and grown in any places without a specific site. So if the pillars are placed on the existing buildings, they will leave the minimum footprint to the earth as well. And last but not least, as you can see from the axonometric over here, the pillar has an ability to adapt its forms and turn into a sustainable device that supports our daily life. For example, the wind turbine, the water collector, and the shading device. To give an example of one single unit scale, these four states over here could be the possibilities when the pillar system become a part of our life. The system can be set in various ways related to the user needs in different periods of time. So maybe just to conclude for entire perspective, our proposal is not only turning house to become our self-sufficient or a center place of life, but it's also empowering a community in environmental and social approaches. You can see in our section diagram that we try to decide the structure that can support the growth of community and can easily construct it by manpower. Eventually, our life cycle system is created to manage how people handle death and in turn, how they live to honor the earth and their departed for eternity. And we hope that one day it would be the day that even in the last moment of our life, we still live non-toxic to the earth. So that's all for our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. I think, I mean, very uh, deep experience, very deep ideas, feelings, <laughs> and everything like is strictly involved with architecture, and that's very interesting to see, you know. Thank, so, you. Uh, Thank and, you. And as Rafael is saying, such great graphics. That's very also important Thank to you. represent the ideas. Now we are going to have a series of short interventions. Uh, I will start uh, also because I had the, I would say the complicated 
task to write a short conclusive chapter at the end of the book and to do it, I review all the proposals and all the preparatory lectures we had before the event. And I try to put together the most common ideas from those. I mean, and, and from those, I would like to take these minutes to underline some of them. And I wanted to start with the perception that although humanity has gone through various periods of crisis, it does not take long to rebuild the ideas of abundance, of in infinity resources, exploiting the planet for generation to generation without consequences. And recently, the intense process of globalization estranged this feeling, expanding the reach of people and opening the possibilities of consumption to a global market. Thanks to the distance, the consequences of the exploitation of people and resources seem invisible. With the arrival of the pandemic, these relationships relationships became evident when they began to fail, demonstrating consequences far beyond the borders of the affected place. This fact triggered an intense process of fragmentation. The territories that seemed to be in constant expansion began to shrink, limiting their scope as well as the possibilities of displacement. Quickly, the global illusion of, of abundance was exposed manifesting the delicate balance that tries to keep societies functioning today. One of the most visible consequences of the pandemic was the widespread confinement. Many societies got used to their daytime life unfolding through the city, while the house was, the only, was only a place to sleep. But that situation changed rapidly with the confinement. With the confinement, it became clear that homes have being increasingly disconnected from the city, a typical process from the 20th century. Balconies became more visible than ever, starting in all kinds of scenes. At the same time, the roof took on a new prominence, places to take a break, a breath, or rest from the confinement without the police having access. Living this process surely made us appreciate the public space and the possibility of going out much more, which before was perfectly normal and could be even overlooked. Even faced with the consequences of the pandemic, it is clear that we are not giving up the urban life. The issue is not to leave the city, but to change it. The city is originally understood as a place of welcome, protection, prosperity, and it is the same access, those, those same access that should be at the center of development. Build a governance system where the individual and the collective are synchronized instead of facing each other. While reflecting on how to deal with the pandemic and its consequences, maybe it's even more important to be borne in mind that there is no vaccine for environmental degradation. Currently, most of the population understand this phenomenon, but as there is significant consensus on some of the actions that should be taken, there are also significant obstacles, obstacles to the implementation. Since the world was, since the world we want those, <coughs> sorry, since the world we want those to not exist, some things that have changed recently should not return to the previous normality. We have the task of imagining a new future and making the most of the spaces for debate and interaction, as this one. In the base of cases, the pandemic will have accelerated innovation and change. Issues that were pending and that progressed slowly has been, have been accelerated by this situation. Perhaps the best example is online education, which has had been growing but has now been shown as a powerful possibility. The pandemic has created a vacuum that we should take care of, but there is no need for a refoundation, restart or revolution, but for an evolution that learns from both and bad, from good and bad. As activities normalize, there is an opportunity to embed greater equality and sustainability into the recovery 
accelerating rather than delaying progress towards 2030. Even so, it is necessary to understand first, it is not a short nor simpler process. Second, it is neither the only nor the first call to implement the necessary changes. And third, it is about moving against the current and against the majority. So we as designers, we have a lot to do. And the work that you presented today is an important demonstration of this initiative. As I say, I had the task to, to review all this information and to put together some of the general ideas. And they, they, were, trans they were crossing, I would say, all the proposals and the discussion. Now I would like to invite Matilde Marengo as IAC Head of, Head of Studies to share with us her perspective about the competition. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm sorry, I'll just smile. Jeez. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm connecting from IAC uh, today. And I, I just wanted to actually uh, thank you all uh, for the fantastic presentations and everyone who uh, contributed to the competition for the, the fantastic contributions. Um, as Vicente was saying, it's uh, the thickest book so far, um, and there's a great quantity of really important stuff um, that has been sort of uh, produced in this book. Um, I wanted to quickly talk about a little bit uh, why this competition is so important. So Vicente gave some insight on the origin of the competition, um, but I just wanna look at the competition uh, generally. Sorry, I just need to drink some water. So um, as, as most of you probably already know, uh, the aim of the Advanced Architecture Contest is to promote um, a discussion and research uh, through which we can generate insights and visions, um, ideas and proposal, um, and, and you know, give form in some way uh, to, to what the city and the habitat of the 21st century um, will be like. Um, and that's something that we've definitely seen today in these proposals. Um, so in some way, uh, as Fabio was saying, you know, we as designers have, have this, um, you know, responsibility to take into consideration uh, what is the future habitat uh, that our society needs and give form to this. Um, so the competition is open to architects, engineers, planners and designers who want to contribute um, to progress in making the world a more habitable place by developing proposals that are capable of responding to emerging challenges. Um, so the areas that we look at are ecology, information technology, architecture, urban planning, and of course, the future of living. Um, so each competition focuses on a different topic uh, that's central on, on one side to the IAC agenda, um, but also to global habitability challenges. Um, and as IAC, uh, the competition follows the digital revolution at all scales to expand the boundaries of architecture and design to meet the challenges faced by humanity. Um, so the competition therefore acts as a platform that allows us to collectively come together and we, we saw the topic of collectivity in, in some of the projects today across the IAC network, but also beyond the IAC network to innovate and shape the future habitat for our society, but more importantly, build it in the present. So although Fabio's already uh, taken us through uh, some of the, the important points, I wanna reiterate um, some of the goals, uh, the important goals that came out for, for me today um, in, in the projects that we saw um, and how learning from we can design for the future of living. Um, so some of these include fostering inclusivity, quality and accessibility for all, uh, enabling new and green economies and transitions, um, circular material cycles and innovative construction systems, disruptive renewable energy systems and collaborating with nature. Um, so I'm really happy to see these projects. I'm really happy to put faces uh, to some of the people who design the projects. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy to say that I think we, the, the competition has been incredibly successful um, in developing adaptable, flexible and robust solutions um, like the ones that we've seen today and the others that you can enjoy in the publication. So I, I invite you all to check them out. 
um, and allow us together uh, to all contribute to pioneering innovative and positive change uh, for the future of our planet. Uh, so thank you so much for taking part in the competition, uh, being here today and, you know, becoming part of the IAC network. Thank you, Matilda. Thank you. I think you say something very important. Put faces on the people that made the effort to, you know, to, to express their ideas. Absolutely. I think the collective aspect, the 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 fact of coming together um, and designing this change is is essential. Um, it's it's definitely a central thing for IAC, um, and it's uh, you know transmitted through this competition totally. Sure. Thank you. Now I would like to invite Daniel Ibanez, as I would, as, as Vicente say, a previous winner of the competition, but also as representative of the jury in this one. Daniel, please. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you, Matilde. Thank you, all of you, for your presentation. It was fantastic to um, to get this kind of like summary again. I enjoy many of these uh, proposals. Uh, you know, a few months uh, ago when we were debating. Um, of about the strengths uh, of, of many of these, uh, um, you know, uh, proposals and, and visions for the future. So uh, fantastic to see you all. Thank you so much again for uh, for all your work on these. Um, you know, as Fabio was saying uh, and Vicente before, uh, you know, I, I want to speak maybe as, as one of you, that's somebody that, you know, I would say almost 15 years ago was in a very similar situation. I decided to, you know, did, did the first uh, advanced um, um, architecture design competition from IAC. Um, you know, again, I was a very uh, recent graduate, uh, very excited about the opportunity. We gave, uh, you know, our best. We spent a lot of time. Uh, we, you know, were lucky to to win. And then, you know, the the my life radically changed at that moment. You know, the opportunity of going to IAC, stay there doing the master, and then staying as a researcher, and then further as a professor, leading several really interesting projects. Really you know, radically transform the way I see life today, the way I do architecture. So anyways, I, I think, you know, regardless of the result, uh, you know, doing and uh, devoting time to this kind of like initiative, it's a, it's always, uh, you know, super positive and, you know, obviously a special for those of you that, uh, that, um, you know, got the best, the best results out of, out of that. So anyways, um, uh, super excited about it. Um, the other thing I want to just simply, you know, quickly mention that I, really enjoy about all this proposal and I think it's, it's very um, uh, relevant today is that we see a lot of uh, people analyzing the state of the art, what are the kind of like, you know, urbanization conditions. We see also many work being done from the critical side, people saying like, this is not, this is not good, this is bad. But, you know, I think the more and more becomes clear that we need people like us, people like you guys, designers that really put visions forward. It's very easy to say like what is wrong and analyze the current situation or be critical about it, but it's not as easy to really project, to really start envisioning how the future can uh, can look. So again, um, I want to just simply underscore that dimensions on you know all the proposal and especially for, for the ones that we have seen recently of, of the winners, that is extremely important and more relevant than ever. You know, we need, we need less analysis and more visions of, of how the future can uh, can look. The second thing I want to uh, to mention that I was particularly um, uh, you know pleased to see throughout uh, all the proposals is um, is the fact that while most of you are trying to provide solutions for particular aspects, you are doing that in a way that is really taking the larger consequences in, uh, uh, you know, into consideration, right? We, we, we have seen throughout history many times that, you know, maybe there is a technological solution that, you know, helps to solve something at one scale, but then it's really having co large bad consequences at other scale. I think one of the really breakthroughs on the way that many of these proposals are unfolding is precisely that you guys are trying to, you know, through architecture, provide solutions for the people that are going to inhabit those, generate new ways of living that simultaneously is trying to benefit other scales, uh, you know, other constituencies, other non-human kind of like actors. So I thought that was extremely uh, uh, positive as a kind of like change, almost I would say as almost as a generational change, you know, like not thinking on the larger repercussions of an intervention today uh, is something that nobody can afford. And I think it's, it's really great to see uh, throughout all these, all these proposals. And then 
And the last thing, very briefly, I want to mention that, you know, that is very explicit visually on all your proposals when you start, you know, drawing these kind of like diagrams of different relations to try to see how one thing that you are intervening is really taking in consideration like multiple factors for the people that are living, for the materials that you are being used, for the ecological um, uh, values associated with each of those decisions. So I think re this really... Um, to me is a, a generational change. I think you guys are really starting to lead, you know, what is what is basically the future that we cannot keep thinking that design is an isolated, uh, you know, endeavor that happens in a very specific place, but rather trying to design, taking in consideration these larger, um, you know, externalities and, and processes that are around it. So it was really, uh, you know, delightful uh, to see. And, and again, thank you all for, for the work. I'm very much looking forward to, again, see all your work in, in the form of a book publication. I'm pretty sure that's, uh, I have not seen yet uh, the, the result, but I'm pretty sure it would be a fantastic uh, publication um, uh, to, to enjoy. So thank you for allowing me to be part of the jury. Thank you for uh, reminding me what was to be in your position 15 years ago. That was uh, fantastic. and very much looking forward to, uh, to see how all this uh, develops in the next uh, uh, few years. Thank you, Daniel. As you say, the book is, is a, an effort to recognize the, all the work that all these uh, people, designers, made to, in order to express and to bring some, some kind of solution or proposal to these complex topics. Um, now, to, to conclude, I would like to invite Ricardo to show us uh, the book, but also to give us a couple of words about, about it. Okay, thank you, Fabio, and thank you, Vicente, and all of the IAC team for having us, giving us the chance to, to co publish with you such amazing books. In fact, many of them, I have been counting more than 10 books that we are co publishing together. We have an amazing bestseller as the Metapolis Dictionary of Architecture or the recent IAC Bix, the magazine that we co published with them, as well as the last publication of the Threefold Logics of Method Architecture by Manuel Gausa and Jordi Vivalde, both faculties at DIAC, and many, many other books that we, we have the chance to, to publish together. No? Um, only to mention that ACTAR always has been committed to, to take into account this kind of advanced knowledge. And for us, always has been a very big uh, honor to, to release together with you all of the results of the, of the Advanced Architecture Contest. No? Um, it's already available. It's an amazing book. Uh, I congratulate as well the team in, in the IAC for the amazing uh, design, layout, and all of the production. And for sure, you will enjoy uh, the final results. Thank you. And congratulations for all of you. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you for the constant support in this relation about, you know, bringing the ideas, making the ideas public somehow. It's not only about producing them, but it's also letting them know around. So thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, well, Fabio, maybe uh, I would like uh, just to, because, uh, because, um, Ricardo mentioned, I would like to mention also Lina Salamanca, that is the designer uh, at IAC, that uh, she's the one that is, uh, that has the, developed the book and has put all the projects together. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could mention also the four people at Vaidaura Lab that were working on, on that, no? Yes, on the, on the book, we had the help of Rebecca Binderwick, Patemine Tayao, that is out, Jan Guantian and Paulina Sevilla, who you saw them presenting, and also helping Lina Salamanca, we had Dayana Gonzalez in the designing of the book. Good. So I am back from the car. Uh, I am still in the middle of nowhere. Uh, now in a small village in the middle of Spain, you see, with uh, very basic architecture. But I would like to thank again to everyone uh, that is there, everyone that has participated in the, in the competition, and for those that are coming to study at IAC uh, next year, uh, yeah, we are waiting uh, you with a lot of energy. We have a 
uh, revolution to do in uh, in architecture. Yeah, has been always committed with innovation and with new projects. So everyone is always welcome to Yak, and thank you to all of you for the, your great effort. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the presentation. Everything was great. Thank you.